How are we doing this morning? If I haven't had the pleasure to meet you yet, my name is Keisha. I'm glad you guys are here. I've called this place home for almost six years now, and I have the honor to serve on staff in the creative department. Now, you might know this about me, but if you don't know, I'm not from America. I come all the way from the beautiful tropical land of Indonesia. I actually moved here in 2013 for school. So other than one of my sisters who's currently in Pennsylvania, all of my family members are still back home, thousands of miles away from me. None of them is anywhere near me, so over the years, I have had to learn to develop and build intentional relationships, friendships with people here in Oklahoma. So even when I don't have family here, I have family here. You know what my favorite thing about friends are? You get to pick them. You don't really get to pick your family, but you get to pick and choose who you allow to be in your lives as your friends. I love my friends. Our friend group consists of people who look different from each other, are in different life seasons, and have different life stories. And if there's one thing that we all have in common, it is that faith brought us together. Every single day, we work on being a group of people who loves God, loves people, and follow Jesus. They keep me busy, they keep me accountable, they correct me, they love me when I'm being a punk, and most importantly, they show me what it's like to have a spiritual family. I wanna tell you a story. Back in 2019, my friend Sheridan and I decided we should run a marathon. No, not the half, the whole 26.2 miles of it. Now, side note, I've, I, need, I need you to know, I'm not a runner. I'm barely a jogger. I can walk really well, though. <laughs> Running's not my thing. But I do like checking things off of my bucket list, so we're like, okay, let's do this. We signed up for the 2020 Nashville Marathon, scheduled in April, pandemic happened, everything is canceled. A few months later, they announced that they're gonna, oops, reschedule the marathon for November 7. We both thought about it. This time it's around June or July, so if, if we are gonna do it, we're gonna have to start training right away. We both said, okay, we're gonna do this thing, because if there's one good thing that comes out of 2020, is that we completed a marathon. So we started our training again, together, from the beginning. There were many hours spent running on the road and on the treadmill. Long hours, early mornings, physical and emotional strain that we put on our bodies. We made it a point this time though that even if they canceled the marathon again, we would still stick to our training. And no matter what or where, on November 7, we're running 26.2 miles. Guess what? They called it off again. <laughs> So we begin to devise a plan. All right, we're gonna put our very own marathon just for the two of us. We planned the route, we secured the goods, water, electrolytes, snacks, we got it all, we gathered the friends. We couldn't have pulled this off without our North group. They were they're gonna be paired off and spread around one and a half, two miles from each other and they would have water stations for us. November 7 finally came. Now, I wanna, I wanna, finish, er, I wanna finish at the same time as Sheridan, so I was like, I'm gonna start earlier so I can finish together, because I'm slower. And since I'm starting much earlier, some of the stations would have not yet been there when I passed by them. And based on my experience of watching TV crime shows, I know that if you run early in the morning, you either come across a dead body or you become one. <laughs> so I'm like, I better ask somebody to follow me around in a car so they can carry my drinks and make sure I'm alive. And since I know just how much my friends lean, I'm really love to wake up at 3.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning, follow me around in a car and cheer me on. I asked them to be my runner driver. They follow me around with the car and they made sure that everything is good. Seeing all of our friends on the route that day on the side of the road on a makeshift water station was probably one of the most memorable things that I have experienced in my life. That day, we completed our marathon. I wanna show you some pictures. This is me and my friend Sheridan after our marathon. This next one is of the three of us. We look a little rough, we've been up since early. <laughs> and this last one is a picture of our whole group that came out and cheered for us. Now, I tell you all that to say that we all need godly friends in our lives. Not just acquaintances, friends. The kind of friend that Proverbs 18, 24 describes, the ones that sticks closer to you than a brother or a sister. There are two things that this makeshift marathon taught me about godly friendship. Number one is, you need friends to run the race with. 
The marathon would not have happened if either me or Sharon were the only ones doing it by ourselves. You need friends to set a goal and step by step, hand in hand, in the trenches, run, run towards the goal together. Yes. Don't do it alone. Encourage one another. Yes. Life is hard, but it's not designed for you to go through alone. God's people will always be his most favorite way to show you just how much he loves you. It's so important though to carefully select the people you let speak into your lives. The people you run the race with, your teammates. These are the people that will love you no matter what. They know you the most, but they still love you no matter what. The person, people you can invite into your deepest thoughts, struggles, and you can share intimacy with. Jesus loves all people, but he had his disciples with whom he does life with every day, and within that he had his three closest friends. So breaking news, not everybody that you meet or like needs to be in your inner circle. Be selective. You get to choose your friends. Number two is this. You need friends to help carry your burdens. The race cannot be run by anyone but me. Galatians 6, 5 says, for one should carry their own load. I can help I can't have someone else run the race for me and claim, oh, I did it. I have to actually go out and put one foot in front of the other. All 26.2 miles are my load to carry. But look at what verse two says. It says, carry each other's burden, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? To love each other as yourself, to bear their burden, to love them as yourself. I can't make anyone carry my load, but they carried my burdens. Literally, they carried my water for me, they carried my food, and they carried my worries away. They carried my burdens. Just very recently, I had to deal with some very hard immigration stuff. I still am in the midst of it. I'm not out of the storm yet. The predicament is I want to stay here in the United States, but it's not an easy process. And if you know, you know. It's hard because I, I'm powerless and I'm facing the unknown. It's hard because there's really not much I could do, but wait. I had a very honest yet discouraging meeting with an attorney and I left that meeting feeling like my world is going to crumble down. I shared this news with a friend who had previously been in a very, very similar situation as myself. And in the middle of me just panic blabbing to her, she, fully understanding the stress that I am in, looked me in the eye and said, I have faith, it's going to be okay. In that moment, I don't have faith. All I could see is gloom, darkness, and despair, but she carried my burden for me. She believed for me, and the Holy Spirit knew that those words from that person at that exact moment is exactly what I needed to hear. Here at North, we refuse to live life alone. Yes. Godly friendships should be foundational in your lives. Now, let's take a look at this video. Hello, hey, my name is Pastor Hetty. I get the great opportunity to serve the Guthrie location for North Church. Today, I just wanted to share with you a relationship that I have that's been centered around faith. This is a relationship that has uh, truly impacted my life uh, in such a way that I think I'm a better uh, servant, community servant, a better husband, and a better father. Uh, I worked at Guthrie Job Corps around 2013, there was a lady by the name of Joy Newton who also worked there. I heard Joy talking about her husband's men's Bible study. And around this time, I was really trying to be intentional about putting myself in a Bible study with, with men. And so when I heard her say this, my ears kind of perked up. I asked Joy if she would, wouldn't mind connecting me uh, with her husband. And so Joy did an email introduction with Dan and I, and then Dan scheduled a time for me to come to his office. I get to Dan's office, I walk into the building, and then I walk into his office, and Dan had plaques uh, from different awards that he had received from being in the community. One was uh, a Business of the Year Award, the other one was a Citizen of the Year Award, and at that moment, I knew that there was something special about Dan, and I wanted to do whatever I could to make sure that I connected with Dan on a, on a deeper level. So once we started talking, I found out that I wasn't going to be able to be a part of her, his uh, men's uh, Bible study. And so I was a little bummed about that, but I was like, in some way, I'm going to make sure that I connect with, with Dan. And so I asked Dan if he would meet with me on Fridays at 6 a.m. 
Dan said yes, y'all. And so Dan and I started meeting on Friday at 6 a.m. And he had this book that he would walk me through. So uh, the book uh, took us through uh, growing in your faith, uh, memorizing scriptures together, and then evangelism, how to share the gospel. One of the ways that I think we really connected was doing the memory verses together. And from that, you, one year, then two year passes, and then three years. And in that third year, something incredible happened, which I think was really cool. I'm at a chamber banquet, and I'm announced as the citizen of the year for Guthrie America. Mind blown, but I'm just thinking about that moment that I walked into Dan's office and saw that award and how much I appreciated to be around somebody who had given that much to the community that they acknowledged him in that way. Now I'm being acknowledged. And then two years later, guess what? I get to present the Lifetime Achievement Award to Dan Newton who now by this time is like my third father. Like I call him Daddy Dan. That's how much uh, he means to me. And I feel like I mean a bunch to him. But our relationship centered around our faith. Until this day, we still meet on Wednesdays now at 8 a.m. to continue to talk about God's word. Hey, let me pray for us. Hey, Father, thank you for sending your son to die for us. It's because of your son that we can have the most important relationship, and that's with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Hetty, for that inspiring story of friendship. I want to jump into another story about friendship. 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 through 4. Scripture says, Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that Jonathan committed himself to David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. And Saul took him that day, speaking of David, and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his military gear, including his sword, his bow, and his belt. If I don't know you, my name's Clint Smith. I'm one of the pastors here at North Church. Great to be with everyone today. I really just want to dive right back into God's word. So if you begin reading this story at 1 Samuel 18, it can be a little bit confusing. All of a sudden, Jonathan, the oldest son of King Saul, has this spiritual bond of some sort with David to the point of the scripture saying that Jonathan loved him as himself. So I think it's important that we set the scene and go back, if you will, to have a little more understanding. You heard earlier the story of David and Goliath and the great victory that David had. He had just be defeated Goliath. The men of Israel had destroyed the armies of the Philistines and plundered their camps. And King Saul is asking Abner, the commander of the army, whose son is this? Abner had no answer for him. So Abner brings David to Saul, and we pick up at 1 Samuel 17, 58. Then Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse. 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 2. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that Jonathan committed himself to David, and Jonathan loved him as himself, and Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. So I asked the question, why this friendship? Why was Jonathan drawn to the friendship with David? I believe the answer is that Jonathan had witnessed David defeating Goliath. He watched as David returned with Goliath's head. Talk about street cred, right? And it's kind of gross as well. <laughs> he heard the conversation between his father, King Saul, and David. Jonathan witnessed all of this. Jonathan saw the faith of David as he told Goliath, the battle is the Lord's and he will hand you over to us. Jonathan also had great faith. Just a few years earlier, 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan attacked an entire Philistine garrison and killed more than 20 men with just him and his armor bearer alone. 
1 Samuel 14, 12, Jonathan tells his armor bearer, the Lord has handed them over to us. Sound familiar? Almost exactly, word for word, what David said to Goliath. Once again, we see an example of great faith. This friendship was built on faith. Now, some in our culture don't believe this to be true. In fact, if you were to go search David and Goliath, excuse me, David and Jonathan, you would see articles claiming that David and Jonathan had a same-sex relationship. Although all scripture is clear that they loved one another, there's no mention of sexual relationship. There is mention of a kiss, but not how we think of kissing in our world today. So I thought it would be important for us to go back and take a look at the cultural context of the time. First of all, both of these men were married during the time frame of their friendship. Secondly, it was customary to kiss as a greeting or a goodbye. The holy kiss is referenced multiple times throughout scripture, and it was a sign of friendship, much like the modern day handshake, or if we're living in 2021, the fist bump. You know what I'm saying? Then lastly, it was easy for us to assume that Jonathan and David were the same age. I think I've always assumed that myself, but as I began to research, we don't know for sure the age difference, but most likely, Jonathan was around 20 years older than David, and Jonathan was taking David under his wing. That was the nature of this relationship. This relationship illustrates godly, faith-filled friendship. Healthy friendship is not something that's promoted in our society today, but God promotes healthy friendships. So what can we learn from this faith-filled friendship? First of all, friendship honors one another. We'll take a look back at 1 Samuel 18, 4. Jonathan gave David his robe and all his military gear, including his sword, his bow, and his belt. Jonathan was the oldest son of King Saul. So guess who was in line to be the next king of Israel? You got it, Jonathan. Jonathan, instead of becoming jealous and operating in jealousy and self-centeredness like his father, he chose to operate in faith once again, even though David could have been a threat to the throne. Imagine this, Saul is literally bringing David into his home and treating him as a son. Jonathan's response is not to get mad, angry, and bitter. His response is to give him his royal robe and treat him as his equal. It reminds me of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests but also for the interests of others. I pray, God, let that penetrate our hearts and our minds. Let that be an anthem of the way that we lived with Christ's example. Friendship protects what is right. Friendship protects what is right. In 1 Samuel 20, 13, we see Jonathan is speaking to David. And the scripture says, if it pleases my father to do you harm, may the Lord... Do so to me and more so if I fail to inform you and send you away so that you may go into safety. And may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. What is Jonathan saying here? He's saying, if I know and am aware that my father wants to hurt you and is plotting to hurt you, then I will alarm you and let you know so that you can go to safety. Jonathan is protecting David from his own father. At the same time, he's still trying to honor his father. An important note here is that by this time in scripture, King Saul had lost his mind. He was a madman at this point, yet David continued to honor and serve him. Saul was full of anger, envy, and hate towards David. To the point on multiple occasions, he plotted to kill him. He has this back and forth between reason and insanity, and Jonathan was his voice of reason. 
saying things like, Dad, isn't this the same David that has served you? Isn't this the same David that led your armies into victory? Protection comes in a variety of ways. Many times protection comes to defend. That's what Jonathan's doing for David in this specific situation. He's defending his friend. This is a very common form of protection. But protection could also look like holding someone accountable when needed. Because your real friends protect you by being real with you. We need more people in our life telling us what we need to hear instead of what we want to hear. Pastor Rodney referenced John chapter 15, verse 13, a few weeks ago. Greater love has no one than this, that a person will lay down his life for his friends. So lean in with me just a bit. It has been said that blood is thicker than water. What does this mean? What do people mean by that? I think most of the time people mean that you should put family first in your life. Family is very important to me. If you know me personally, you know that family is really important to me. But what I have found healthy in my life is that your family should be your friends and your friends should become your family. Get this, the blood of Jesus brings us together as family and faith should be the foundation that all family and friendship is built on. Proverbs 18, 24 a person of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And that's the kind of friend that we're talking about today. So how do I get a good friend like this? What does that look like? I think Jonathan is an incredible example for all of us. He saw something in David that he admired. He saw something that they had in common and instead of waiting around and wishing that David would become his friend, he was intentional about approaching him and being a friend first. We can't expect friends to always come to us. In order to have friends, we must be a friend. I love the story that Kasia shared about her North group rallying around her to run a marathon. So powerful, what an incredible example. Something that really inspires me is the thought that at some point in her journey, Kasia decided to fill out a card or to go online and sign up to be a part of that North group. That small act of intentionality has changed her life. I was thinking back to the early days of North Church, the first small group that I was ever a part of at North Church, we used to meet at the IHOP off of Memorial. And I'm gonna tell you something else that has the power to change your life, the quick two egg breakfast. <laughs> change your life in more than one way. The bond that I still have with those men carries on today. Intentionality of joining together with someone else in kingdom and community makes all the difference in the world. And you can make that decision today to say, God, I, I need a friend and I'm gonna do something about it. I'm gonna believe that you're going to lead me and you're gonna guide me, but I'm also gonna be intentional and I'm gonna fill out a North Group's card today because I need kingdom community in my life. I love Hetty and Dan's story, story as well a story of discipleship. Our women's and men's discipleship have developed some incredible relationships. Right now, we have more than 70 men that have committed to reading the North Reading Plan together and then sending application and what God's doing in their life through the scripture to each other via text message daily. That's powerful. That has the power to change your life. had one of our guys, Mike, he came up to me last Sunday at church and he said, hey pastor, if you see Dan here, this is another Dan, Dan's are popular today. 
If you see Dan here, introduce me to him because we've been texting and talking about God's word and I wanna make sure that I meet him today. That's intentionality. That's how friendships are birthed and how God does what God does. That's how he changes our lives and impacts us. Would you stand to your feet with me? I wanna challenge you to be intentional. That could look like you going out to the connections area and saying, hey, how do I become a part of a group? That could look like you coming up to me and asking about women's and men's discipleship, someone else that's a part of that program that you might know, how, how can I become a part of that? How do I get to meet people like that? It could be as simple as you deciding today that you're going to invite somebody to a coffee meeting this week. You're gonna ask someone to go to lunch. You're going to be intentional in what you're doing. But I wanna do this, I wanna pray a prayer of intentionality over you that God would give you faith-filled friendships. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much and we thank you for the friendship that we have with your son, Jesus Christ. He is primary in our life and he is the example of what other relationships should look like in our life, Lord. We love you and honor you and I pray that if we don't have a relationship like that, God, that you would give us that connection, that you would send us in the right area, that you would help us to be more intentional and put ourselves in the right environments, Lord. Help us to be that kind of friend to someone else as well, Lord. We love you and we thank you and we thank you for kingdom community, God, and I pray that we never take it for granted. In Christ's name, yes. amen.